Hey guys and welcome to Aussie Reviews and welcome to December Q&A. First of all, apologies for the delay because I did have a little bit of a break over the Christmas and New Year period so I certainly hope that you guys enjoyed yours as well. So as always guys, um, if you want to submit your questions, um, you have to be a supporter of Aussie Reviews on Patreon. You can do that from as little as a dollar a month so if you want to um, jump in and be a part of this, by all means do so. Okay, so let's get into the questions for this month. We've got quite a few to get through. So the first question I've got here is from Tony and he says, uh, Good morning, Aussie. Can you explain how barrel tuners and talking the barrel down work and if possible, go through the process in a future video? Well, mate, look, I've never ever used them. Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, a fellow that I did speak to at the range some years ago now was using one um, on his uh, Bentress 22LR. And uh, basically I said, you know, what's the story with these? How do they actually work? And uh, he explained with the actual barrel vibration that, you know, you do um, have an opportunity there to have basically a weight that you can move up and down on that barrel to find the sweet spot to minimize uh, that vibration. And that's how it was explained to me. Uh, from what I've uh, read over the years as well, um, that's exactly how people go about doing it. Um, look, if there's a company here in Australia and they'd like me to have a look at one, um, look, I'd be more than happy to do so. But honestly, for me, I mean, I'm not that uh, crazy about the accuracy. I like just using normal uh, firearms as they are out of the box there and, um, you know, just trying to get the best accuracy I can through that. So, um, yeah, mate, I, I can't um, lie to you. I've not used them, so I don't know much more about them than that, sorry. Next question I've got here is from Michael and he says, um, uh, are you gonna host another shooting day, Aussie? Uh, like you had at the Ipswich Pistol Club a while back. That was awesome. Well, mate, yes, um, there's a lot of things I plan to do hopefully this year in 2019. And uh, that's something that's definitely on the list. Everyone had a fantastic time there and uh, it's just a good day in general. So yeah, keep an eye out. Um, I'll definitely put the announcement out and uh, obviously people who support me on Patreon will have first dibs at the tickets for the day because as um, we did last time, we had to limit it to 100 people. So um, yeah, those of you who are supporting me on Patreon will have uh, first dibs on those tickets and then if there's any left after that, it'll then go out to the wider audience or the followers of the channel. Now, Michael asks here, he says, any chance of a review on a Ruger American 450 Bushmaster? Mate, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I could organise one of them. Um, they seem to be pretty popular in the States, you know, especially in the AR semi-auto uh, platforms, um, you know, very hard hitting rounds. So uh, I'd expect it to be, um, you know, very similar to um, other hard hitting rounds of the 45 calibre. So uh, yeah, something I'd definitely be interested in doing. So um, we'll see how we go. Next question I got here is from Patrick and he says, um, Hi Ozzy, all the best for Christmas and the new year to you and yours. Well, thank you, mate. I appreciate that. Uh, do you know if the Gunslick foam bore cleaner um, is still available? Um, also, do you have any thoughts on the Terrapin X? Cheers, Pat. Uh, mate, basically, uh, Gunslick has been uh, stopped by Naya. They were the importers and now they've gone over to Hoppy. So um, Hoppy's number nine foam bore cleaner is pretty much a replacement from what I can see. So uh, pick yourself up some of that and I'm sure you'll be pretty happy with it. It'll do just the same job as the Gunslick um, foam ball cleaner. Now the next part of your question here, have I seen the uh, Terrapin X? Yes, I have. Uh, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about here, it's basically a very high end range finder. Um, you're supposed to be able to range out to like 3000 meters. Um, there's a app where you can um, connect it to your smartphone. Uh, but the price is certainly up there as well. You know, it's over $3,000 here in Australia. So uh, what are my thoughts on it? Um, look, if you have a, a requirement or, you know, you're going to actually use all the features in that um, high-end rangefinder, by all means, you know, get one. But for me, like, you know, I got the loophole, the 2800 uh, TBR, which, you know, ranges out to uh, 2800 yards. I mean, that's more than enough for me. Most people, if you're shooting at a range, you know, you're not gonna go any further than a thousand yards or, or meters. And, um, you know, that's measured anyway. So there's really no uh, need for a range finder at that distance. The only thing I could think of that you'd possibly use it would be if you're shooting on private property. 
and then you went out, um, you know, beyond a thousand. Uh, that's the only reason I could I could think of. I mean, if you're hunting, forget it. You're not going to be shooting at that distance hunting, and and you you really shouldn't. The chance of just injuring an animal and then losing it because you've got to go so far to track it, um, yeah, that's just not uh, ethical in my view. So. Uh, yeah, mate, if you've got a requirement for it, by all means, but me personally, I just want to be able to range stuff out to probably, you know, 1,500 yards, um, 1,000 yards around there just for the reviews, so um, that would be my limit. Next question I got here is from Shannon, and he says, Hi Ozzy, uh, any chance of continuing the beginner series with a video on how to break in and the cleaning requirements of a 22 lr rimfire uh, in general? Thanks, mate. Uh, look, it's pretty straightforward, mate. Yes, I could. Um, you know, if there's a certainly a amount of people that like to see it, I'd definitely do the video. But it's pretty straightforward, mate. It's not like a center fire. Basically, with a rim fire, you just simply buy ammunition and use it. The only trick with a rim fire, with what I've found, is a lot of the time it needs a mag or two run through the new ammo before it settles in. You know, they can be very finicky rim fires. As for cleaning them, you know, um, the cleaning process isn't as uh, crazy as what it is with a center fire because you just don't have that copper fouling you know with a 22 lr so all i do is i just simply uh, put a patch with g96 on it um, down the uh, bore and just clean it out from there um, obviously all your areas you know your um, the feed ramp uh, to your chamber there uh, you know the mag well your bolt bolt face um, you know if you are using a bolt action that is um, you know, even if you're using others, I mean, you're still going to try to clear that um, or clean that bolt face, I should say. So, yeah, all those sort of things you want to do. I like to put G96 on the outside of the firearm as well, just to just to lubricate it and clean it, just so that you store it and then you pull it out and it's nice for next time. But with a 22, mate, honestly, it's just so minimal. Um, they do run fairly dirty, but in saying that, I just find you know you can just get a patch. G96, push it through, push another patch through, and it's pretty much done until you use it next time, and it will shoot nice and accurately for you. Uh, but like I say, I could do a video on it, but that's just a, a general answer for you now. Now, the next question I got here is from Lindsay, and he says, uh, hey Oz, um, uh, I'd love to hear um, any thoughts or experience with any of the break action coach style shotties. Um, I made the call and order NACAR Churchill side-by-side -side, uh, 12 gauge with a 20 inch barrel, seems great value and quality. A fun cowboy gun uh, and also would do well in the uh, scrub. Well mate, yeah, I, I used to have a Boido uh, side by side, um, you know, some years ago and it was a lot of fun, you know, as a three inch chamber and you put some three inch Magnum cartridges in it and it's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Very loud and uh, it certainly attracts a lot of attention. Um, yeah, for fun, I mean, because you've asked here in the second part of the question, um, what would be my choice um, for firearms purely for enjoyment and fun? Well, mate, two really come straight to mind. I mean, a 22 lr I mean, I just love shooting a 22. If any of you have seen the videos, you know, where Miss Zozzy is shooting uh, and shoots, you know, out the 300, I mean, we often um, have a shoot with that and uh, get it all sighted in at that distance and just have a bit of fun with it, you know. And to be quite honest, we were doing it the other day and uh, she beat me by one shot, which uh, I've not lived down yet. So, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, that's a lot of fun. And um, you know, on a shotgun side of things, I mean, I, I do like the uh, the Akar triple barrel. I know it's a, it just looks different, things like that. But uh, you know, in a 20 inch version of that, that single trigger, bang, bang, bang. You know, you got three shots. It's just a whole heap of fun. Um, so yeah, they would probably be my choices. I mean, um, I'm sure you're asking what my choices would be. Uh, within the legal requirements here in Australia for most shooters because you know if we scrap all that I mean obviously there's nothing more fun than a, a 10.22 or um, you know you've got a semi-auto shotgun that they're just a heap of fun but obviously you know there's the restrictions here in Australia so yeah that would be my answer on that one Lindsay. Now next question I've got here is from uh, Gavin and he says uh, there's a really volatile political climate at the moment. What can you share about movements on the ground that people are undertaking to advance their own political careers and our issues with them? Well, mate, the biggest one at the moment is um, uh, the news in the last week is uh, David Lionhelm is saying that he's um, resigning from uh, the federal Senate and he's actually going to run 
uh, in the New South Wales uh, election for the upper house there. So uh, that's probably the biggest news. Um, and I do sort of agree with what he was saying. I mean, um, yes, he can do some changes at the federal level, but for the things that are very close to his heart, not only just firearms, but, you know, just the nanny state stuff in general. Um, you know, you have to be uh, in power at a state level to really have a lot of effect, uh, you know, especially within that state. And let's look at uh, what's happened with those gel blasters in the last couple of weeks. Like New South Wales, you know, <laughs> Um, categorising them as air rifles. I mean, come on. Uh, anyhow, but of course they've got their clause in there that says, oh, if it duplicates, um, you know, a military firearm, then that's what it's going to be classed as. So Cat D firearm. Well, it's just, it, it's so embarrassing. It's ridiculous. Um, but anyhow, they really think they're doing everything for public safety and saving the world. But um, all they're doing is just taking more and more piece by piece, as we've discussed many a times, you know, in the time that I've been running this channel. Uh, what else? Uh, Fraser Anning, he's in the news of late as well. Um, now, Fraser is a uh, avid shooter. Um, you know, he's uh, been at uh, competition level before. Uh, you know, loves shooting handguns, I believe. Um, I've, I've never met him to date. I've never met him, but um, had a look at his uh, previous history there. And uh, yeah, you know, he comes from a farming background, um, just a common sense man. But we've seen him in the media just being attacked relentlessly by the loopy left wing media uh, and just making crap up about him. So in other words, you know, the biggest thing is about him going down to this ultra right wing neo-Nazi rally, as they put it, where we just had uh, Australians who are just fed up with everything um, and, uh, and want their voices heard. So what have they done? Um, they've taken a, a snippet there of a few people getting along and doing Nazi salutes, um, you know, and then tried to label him as a supporter of that. I mean, I just see that as just absolutely ridiculous because Fraser, when you listen to him speak, he's very calm. Um, you know, he articulates his message quite clearly. And, um, you know, if he was really a neo-Nazi, do you think he would be down there meeting with Vietnamese shop owners and, and listening to their concerns that they have? Um, you know, with African gangs stealing, robbing and attacking them. I mean, you know, it's time for this uh, political correctness BS to just be thrown out the window and just the facts be looked at. No one's going along here uh, being neo-Nazis saying that they want to grab these people and throw them into gas chambers and all the rest of it that Nazis did back in the uh, Second World War. I mean, it's just taken ridiculously out of context and uh, good on him. I mean, you know, not that I expect Fraser to be watching this, but if he was, I'd like to thank him for standing true to his beliefs. Um, you know, he and David Lionhelm both I respect because they both stand true to what their beliefs are and they don't go wavering on it, you know, and they do represent what people want. So um, good on them. Um, you know, as for attacking him over the $3,000 or whatever it was in uh, tax um, payers uh, funded money for him to attend the rally then the day like what about the rest of them what about the Labor Party with the way they just waste and spend money with all their private junkers you know like it, it's just ridiculous so where I'm going with this guys is you know they love to single out someone who's actually standing up for right-wing leaning beliefs you know and just label them fascist Nazi all the rest of the stuff under the Sun it's just absolutely ridiculous in my view so Anyhow, uh, yeah, Gavin, that's what's happened at the moment, mate, that I know about. If there's something else, I'm, I'm not too sure. But I really hope that people from New South Wales get behind David Lionhelm at the next uh, New South Wales election uh, and get him elected there because, geez, you guys need a voice down there. Um, with everything that's happening, I mean, you know, you've even got magazine limits on rimfire cat A's down there. I mean, it's just absolutely insane in my view with what's going on down there and it's just getting worse and worse and worse and you guys need to make sure that you get um, people like David Lionhelm, Liberal Democrats, uh, you know, get them in power down there so that you actually have a voice and someone standing up for you. So yeah, anyhow, that's uh, the story from what I know anyway, Gavin. Now the next question I've got here is from Cam and uh, there's a, a couple of questions he's got. He says, first thing, mate, um, Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. With that, I'd like to ask uh, three questions this month. Uh, the, the first is a request only. 
about a shotgun beginner's guide covering basics like ammo types, permitted cut A and B shotgun types and brands with some tips and advice around uh, maintenance. Mate, definitely, what a fantastic idea. Um, I'm very happy to do that. So um, yeah, keep an eye out for that one because I think a lot of people will be quite interested in understanding, you know, just uh, using different chokes, what shot sizes perform better with what chokes and distances and things like that. So um, yeah, great idea. Thanks very much for submitting that, Cam. Um, now the second part of your question here, mate, is about bench rests. Uh, you've said here, I see many types of bench rests on eBay and on the shooting range. Which do you recommend is best suited for a 308 type rifle? Well, mate, look, if you're just having a little bit of fun and things like that, you don't have to spend ridiculous amounts. However, I wouldn't go near any uh, bench rests that you find on eBay. Um, it's like people who buy bipods off eBay, you know, and they're like, oh, it's fantastic. I actually had a, uh, a mate of mine who um, did exactly that, and I had my Harris bipod, and we were actually out shooting, and he folded the legs down of this Chinese one that he bought off eBay that he was bragging about was so good, and you wouldn't believe it, the actual leg fell off right in front of us. And I just shook my head and I said, I rest my case. <laughs> That's exactly why you don't buy uh, stuff like that from eBay. So the same thing with uh, bench rest, mate. I'm not really that keen on buying stuff from eBay. Um, I do have a um, uh, rest from uh, Smart Rest uh, called the um, uh, Nitro Force. Now, I'm halfway through doing the review. I'm, I'm still got a little bit of editing to do, but that should be out this month, okay? So keep an eye out for that one um, because it's actually a really good rest and you can also maneuver the uh, rifle left, right, up and down and still have it supported. So really good rest there. Um, if you didn't want that, honestly, I just use that Cardwell um, one. I mean, that's a pretty uh, cheap and reasonable price one. And you know, you guys have seen it on the reviews that I've done, and look, it just works, and it does the job. So if you wanted to do um, something on a budget cam, you know, have a look at one of them, uh, but wait and have a look at that Nitro Force review that should be out this month. Now, your last question was, um, how do I calculate the barrel life of a 308 hunting rifle? I've heard people say 700 rounds, some say 1,000 rounds. Um, what does it depend on? I have shot around 500 rounds in the last eight months, so I wanted to know your opinion. Mate, this is a funny one because a lot of people have so many varying opinions about this. Now, I remember a couple of years ago, I read an article there where they actually did testing um, with a uh, 308. So what they did was they end up shooting 10,000 rounds through it. So how they did it was they'd um, you know shoot, it was a couple of hundred rounds a day, but they would clean it and maintain it. So they were shooting like uh, just under an inch group uh, at 100 prior to actually you know, shooting the 10,000 rounds. And then after the 10,000 rounds, they shot the um, same group. No difference, it wasn't any larger. So um, what I'm getting at here is, mate, once accuracy starts degrading, then you know there's a problem with the, uh, with the, with the barrel or the barrel life, you know, in general, if you've shot a lot of rounds through it. Um, you know, I'm not talking about if you just change ammo and then it starts shooting bad. Well, your barrel's certainly not ruined or, or, or you know, degrading. All it is is if you get the same ammunition and it shoots tight, and then all of a sudden it's not shooting tight after like five years of use, then perhaps your barrel's degrading from there. Now, um, as for the actual rounds and how to minimize, um, or I should say maximize your barrel life, look after your rifle. That's what it comes down to. A lot of guys, you know, they neglect cleaning it because it's a chore, um, clean it every single time you use it, okay? So uh, come in, make sure it's nice and clean. Don't um, shoot it till it's just red hot, you know? You don't wanna be able to touch the barrel and burn yourself on, on, the, on the palm of your hand. So look after your rifle, uh, maintain it, and um, it will last you way more than 700 or 1,000 rounds. I pretty much guarantee that, mate, because I've had several 308s that I've shot thousands of rounds through and they still shoot very, very accurately. So yeah, that's uh, my take on it. I think uh, you don't have much to worry about there provided you take good care of your rifle. The next question I got here is from Chris and he says, hey Ozzy, uh, hope you're well. Um, what scope do you recommend on a centerfire rifle in 270 or 308 caliber? Uh, how do you choose the right scope? The rifle will be used for general hunting of ferals and larger game 
uh, and a very odd day at the range. Uh, thank you, Aussie. Well, mate, um, look, I've actually done a video on choosing the correct centerfire um, rifle with brand, uh, the calibre, and also scope. So, um, you know, that discusses a lot of things that I'll talk about here. I'll definitely answer your question here as well. But have a look at that video because it does answer perhaps some further questions you might have. But in general, what I find with hunting is, you know, so many people do this. They go and get like a 4 to 16 by 50 scope, throw it on their rifle and use that for hunting. You know, if you're out there chasing ferals, I mean, it depends on what type of hunting you're doing. But, you know, if you're chasing pigs, for example, there is no way in the world you're going to have that scope sitting on uh, 16 power, 14 power, 12 power, 10 power. You're going to have that wound down to about probably 4 to 6 power. And the reason for that is once you take that first shot, say you've got a mob of, say, 3 to 5 pigs, they're going to scatter and you're going to have to try to track them. There is no way you can do it when the magnification so high you'll just lose them, okay? You don't have a good enough field of view. So you will wind that magnification back so that you can track them and, uh, and shoot additional numbers. So um, as for the type of scope, look, there's various different types out there. Um, I really don't like Chinese scopes, or Filipino made scopes, I just don't. I know there's several of them out there that actually work work well and people have had no problems with them. I'm, I'm not disputing that at all. All I'm saying is on my own personal gear, I do not like Chinese or Filipino made scopes. I just don't and I won't buy them. Um, my benchmark where I start is at loophole, um, you know, because I find that they got a fantastic warranty. I've never had a problem with any loophole scope. Um, and they're just a good benchmark. I like Trigicon as well. The 3 to 9 by 40 AccuPoint is one of my favorite scopes. And the reason for it is you don't have to use any batteries. You've got that illumination um, without the use of batteries. So very, very good, uh, especially in low light. Um, obviously, if you can afford it, if you can go up to like Carl's, Schmidt and Bender, I mean, fantastic. I mean, I've got a couple of Schmidt and Bender scopes um, that I've had for many years and just absolutely love them. But all my scopes, apart from my Carl's that I've got, um, you know, which is the, um, the 4 to 24 by 56, uh, or sorry, 6 to 24 by 56, um, yeah, that's for long range shooting, okay? That's, that has a specific use. Everything else that I have is either a 1.5 to 6 by 40 or 42, um, a 3 to 9 by 40, um, that's it. Uh, I think the highest I've probably got in my hunting rifles is a Schmidt and Bender Summit, which is uh, 2.5 to 10 by 40. And the only time I use it on 9 power or 10 power is when I'm actually sighting it in. Um, when I'm actually out hunting, it's straight back on 6 power, 5 power or 4 power. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind, mate. Um, you know, the only time that I would even remotely suggest getting like a uh, 4 to 12 or a or a, you know, a, um, a 4 to 16 or, or something like that powered scope, is if you were just uh, putting it on a, um, a varmint rig, you know, where you're not going to be walking around shooting off the shoulder and uh, you're waiting for different animals uh, to come into like a dam or something like that, you're gonna be shooting uh, them at a little bit of a distance of say like maybe like 200 yards or something like that. But, you know, I can easily shoot 200 yards with accuracy at six power. Um, yeah, have a look back to the old Anschutz 1770 223 review I did. Um, yeah, using a uh, Schmidt and Bender 1.5 to 6 by 42 scope, 6 power and shooting at 200 with accuracy. So what more do you want? I um, hope that answers your question anyway, Chris, but um, mate, have a look at that video. I think you'll find it very, very useful. Next question I got here is from Edward and he says, G'day Aussie, uh, could you clear up the Queensland rules regarding borrowing someone else's firearm? Uh, and also, what's the maximum magazine size for a Category A straight pull shotgun? Okay, so the first question, mate, about the uh, borrowing someone's firearm. Uh, temporarily, you can borrow someone's firearm up to three months, okay? You go to the Weapons Act, have a look under Section 35, Subsection 6, Subsection C, if you can remember that, and you'll clearly see there that you can do so um, on a temporary loan basis for three months. Keep in mind though, okay, now a lot of people get tricked up with this, um, you cannot borrow that firearm with the intent on purchasing it, okay? So in other words, say uh, I've got a, a firearm and I loan it to you and I say, oh look, 
just go and try it first, um, you know, and then uh, we'll fix up the permit to acquire later on. Well, no, you can't do that, okay? That, that's actually an offence. So don't leave yourself open. Um, so if you are borrowing a firearm, you are simply borrowing it on a three month temporary basis um, for that reason, not to purchase it, okay? So just keep that in mind, guys, because a couple of people have been caught out with that before. Uh, as for the um, last party question, the magazine limit for category A straight pull shotgun, well mate, you've answered your question there, it's category A. So under category A, which is section two, under the weapons categories regulation, there's no magazine limit, okay? The only time there's a magazine limit is once you go into category B. Now category B shotguns are lever action shotguns only, okay? Straight pulls are classes of bolt action, so they are category A. So no uh, limit there. Um, but once again, don't expect it to uh, stay like that. The antis will fight for uh, limits to be imposed, but that's why we have to elect the correct people into the parliament so we actually have a voice and we can fight these sort of restrictions. Next question I've got here is from Preston and he says, uh, hello again, Aussie, uh, quick one from me. When are you going to have uh, merch available again? Uh, most appears to be out of stock. I'd like to get a hat. Um, the wide brim uh, would be a nice addition. And also a review of a Sour 100 and 243 would be pretty good to see. Happy New Year, mate, and all the best. Okay, so thanks very much, first of all, for that, Preston. Uh, mate, I still have them. Um, if you're referring to my website, like, because I do have aussiereviews.com uh, running um, at the moment, because I was waiting for new stock um, to come in, so it's still a little bit of a wait away. I'm still working out new designs and stuff like that. Uh, but I still have these caps so I've got the uh, fluoro uh, orange camo caps and we still have the sun hats okay I've got them in uh, small medium and large left um, not a whole heap of uh, large left okay um, smalls and mediums I've still got a decent amount um, so yeah mate if you do want one just send me a private message on Facebook and um, yeah we can get you sorted from there Next question I got here is from Gavin. He says, hi Ozzy, uh, could you please discuss or review your thoughts around the best firearm, for example, the Rossi Trifecta or pair of firearms for survival, food, small, large game and self-defense in terms of reliability, easy maintenance uh, and weight, etc. Are there any of the interchangeable barrel firearms even worth considering? Cheers. Uh, mate, first of all, yeah, I, I don't like interchangeable barrel systems. Um, look, I know they work and everything like that. I just prefer to have a separate firearm that I can go straight to the safe, grab it out. It's all sighted in, ready to go. Um, yeah, as for the self-defense stuff, well, obviously we can't have firearms to self-defense here in Australia, but um, theoretically speaking, um, honestly, mate, I mean, for survival and all that sort of thing, um, like Ruger 1022, I mean, just the, the ultimate survival firearm in my view. I mean, you know, it's semi-auto. Um, yeah, you've got 22 for um, taking rabbits. You can shoot the head off game birds, um, you know, and even the zombie apocalypse, so to speak. You've got uh, some rounds there that you can pop off fairly quickly. So um, if we're talking about, you know, stuff you can get on category A, B or H, that sort of thing. Um, honestly, you really can't go past like a double barrel shotgun, a good double barrel shotgun I'm talking about. Um, you know, you can do everything from shooting game birds, um, you know, using buckshot, solids, that sort of stuff to take heavier game, you know, like deer, pigs, stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, if you're in an area where you can use one for self-defense, I mean, you can't get anything more potent than a shotgun at close range for self-defense. So, um, yeah, mate, um, they're the two calibers I'd be looking at. What actual firearms would you get? Well, if you want something that's legal here in Australia on an AB license, um, honestly, you could probably go for uh, like a, you know, Marlin 39A in a 22, you know, the whole 19 rounds. So that's pretty good. Um, or you could go for the... Um, uh, Remington 572, um, I've had one of them before, they're a little 15 round pump 22, uh, pretty good, or just go for a standard bolt action, um, you know, get one that you like, I, I mean, you know, if you want something that's ease of maintenance, um, get a stainless uh, Ruger American 22, you know, um, <laughs> you got, you're going to have uh, the hard polymer stock, you got a stainless uh, barrel and action, so it's going to take the wear out in the field, so there's a few different options there really. Um, 
Well, to be quite honest, they're almost unlimited, mate. It just depends on what you like. Uh, as for the shotgun, I mean, yeah, a, a short coach gun if you wanted something like that. Or you could go like Akar 3, you have three barrels, but get it in the 20 inch version, single trigger, bang, bang, bang. You know, it's just fantastic. So, yeah, that's probably the way I'd go, Gav. Um, yeah, it's up to you, which you um, choose at the end of the day. Now, next question I got here from Colin, he says, uh, hey mate, did you get a reply about why the Dickinson was opening as you were firing it? Is that safe? Uh, no, mate, I haven't emailed them. So, um, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you there, sorry. Um, but I would imagine that it'd be like that with all of them because I've seen a couple of the comments on that review now. Um, for you guys who aren't sure what we're talking about, the T-1000, the shotgun review I did re uh, recently. So under slow-mo, when I was shooting, you could see once the shot was fired, that bolt would come back just ever so slightly and then forward again. Um, so the recoil certainly sent it back. <sighs> yeah, I have to say this, guys, and I, I have said in various reviews, um, you know, I don't expect massive results from a Turkish-made um, a straight pull shotgun that you know usually is is under a thousand dollars um i mean all of them are pretty much the same quality some are a little bit better quality some things are bad in some areas some of them are good in others um you know it's just disappointing that with our laws here that uh we can't have a pump shotgun but you can have these straight pulls you can have lever actions what's the difference really i i, the, I look at it and just go What's the problem? I mean, we should be allowed uh, pump shotguns in my view. I mean, we should be allowed semi-autos, but concentrating on manually operated shotguns here, um, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to have pumps. And then you could actually, you know, buy some quality US made uh, pump shotguns rather than just having to stick to these lever action and uh, straight pull uh, shotguns from Turkey. You know, I just, yeah, I, I'm just not 100% satisfied with the quality of them. Uh, there's always just something that's wrong uh, or something that I really don't like where I personally wouldn't purchase one myself. Um, I know they've got a purpose and a lot of guys, you know, don't have CAT C or D license. So, you know, they want something that they can use to go out and take feral game with, um, you know, with uh, some faster follow-up shots. So I do get that, guys. But in general, um, look, it doesn't surprise me about this, Colin. Um, and, mate, I haven't emailed them because... Honestly, I wouldn't expect a, um, a thorough explanation on it. Now, next question I got here is from John. He says, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you and Mrs. Ozzy. Uh, thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, my questions uh, today relate to the Norsla flavor of calibers. I'm curious to know whether it be worth investing in this new caliber, given I currently own equivalent calibers. In other words, would it be worth selling say my 308 and replacing it with a 30 Norsla or selling a 223 and buying a uh, 22 Norsla or equivalent. I keep hearing how good these whiz bang cartridges are um, and uh, wondered whether or not your thoughts on uh, whether they will outperform your traditional type calibers that have been around for decades and whether or not it would be a significant upgrade to what I currently own. Uh, look forward to your insightful input. Cheers, mate, and all the best for 2019, John. Um, okay, mate, look, in a nutshell, um, you know, like, for example, a 30 Norsla, it's not equivalent to a 308. It's way more. Um, it's more um, equivalent to a 300 Win Mag, so let's compare the two of them. So when you look at, like, the 30 Norsla, like, you know, they'll shoot a 190-grain pill um, at 3,050 feet a second, where a 300 Win Mag... Uh, we'll shoot a um, 190 grain pill at uh, 2,900 feet a second. So what's the difference? 150 feet a second more. So let's weigh up the difference, for example, with 300 wind mag and 30 Norsla. Uh, number one, the 30 Norsla ammunition is going to cost you a bucket load. Um, don't be surprised if it's uh, somewhere around $150 for a, a pack of 20. Um, you definitely have to reload for it. Um, on top of that too, you're going to pay a fair bit for the brass as well. Uh, and the biggest thing to me would be, you know, if you're going out shooting on a trip there, I can pretty much guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of shops that sell ammunition here in Australia won't have 30 Norsla sitting on the shelf ready for you to buy. So, you know, if you ran out of ammo or something like that, you just want to pick up another pack, 
uh, pretty much guarantee you probably half of them would probably have 300 win mags sitting on the shelf. So um, yeah, that's a big um, negative against the 30 nozzle uh, to me. Um, also too is your limitation on the actual types of firearms you can get you know, chambered in that 30 nozzle. Like, you know, you look at 300 wind mag and, and, and virtually every major manufacturer um, makes a firearm chambered in that caliber. Where if you go to 30 nozzle or any of these other, you know, Gucci type cartridges, um, you're very, very limited on the actual manufacturers that make a firearm in that caliber as well. So that's another negative to me. Um, now, I could only see a real advantage, like say for example, with the 30 Nosler over a 300 Win Mag, is if you were shooting like long range, you know, like competition match, that sort of thing. Um, you know, another 150 feet a second, a little bit flatter trajectory, but you gotta look at it um, sensibly here, like, you know, the 300 Win Mag is gonna do the job for you. I mean, you'll shoot out the 1500 yards with that thing accurately, no problem at all. Um, what more do you want? Do you really need to ha go to a Gucci cartridge and be taking a hell of a hit to your wallet? Um, because you'll pay enough for 300 Win Mag, but you'll pay a lot more for 30 Nozla. Um, I did uh, jot down something else that I wanted to touch on with these as well. Uh, yeah, uh, I also um, like the fact that um, you know, your ammunition um, like factory ammo I'm talking about is a lot wider um, you know for the 300 wind mag rather than the 30 nozzler I know it's getting up there but you've just got a lot more um, ammo makers that you know make ammo for 300 wind mag on top of that too if you're going to be using one for hunting I mean what's the difference I mean you know like I've said many a time hunting distances for me is 75 to 125 yards in all the years I've been doing contract uh, shooting work that's been the average shot every single time. Um, you know, you might get a shot here and there where you'll stretch it out to maybe, you know, like 200 yards. But, you know, the difference, let's compare 300 wind mag to 30 nozzle, there's going to be no difference at 200 yards. I mean, that round is going to be screaming along and dead is dead. So, um, yeah, mate, look, that's, that's my thoughts on it. Um, if you want to have something just different, you want to go to the range and go, hey, look what I got, this is something different. Um, you know, a little bit of bragging rights, so to speak, you know, by all means, but I like practicality. I just buy stuff that's practical and works and is very accurate. So honestly, mate, yeah, for me, I, I just don't see a really big market for it. It's very much like the old um, Remington um, Ultra Magnum cartridges. You know, they bought them out um, you know, in, in various different uh, calibers. So you had like the 338 Remington Ultra Magnum, um, the 300 Remington Ultra Magnum, you had a 7mm Remington Ultra Magnum. But you know, like just bring up the ammunition uh, manufacturer pages and see who makes that ammo now. Not many people at all. And I really think that uh, the Norsla stuff will be pretty much the same. You'll have Norsla still making it, but it's going to be very, very narrow on your selection there. Next question I've got here is from Chris and he says, uh, Hello Ozzy, I'm planning on getting my first gun soon, a 22 LR and I've narrowed it down to a CZ455 or a Lithgow LA101. Uh, looking now at scopes for it, um, I'll be using the gun for occasional hunting and days at the range. Um, should I go for an adjustable parallax or would a 3 to 9 by 40 um, uh, be sufficient or should I go for something with more magnification? Uh, mate, look, like I've said, um, you know, with the hunting stuff, look, definitely not. You don't need anything more than a 3 to 9 by 40 on a 22. A lot of people will argue that they, even that is overkill. Um, depends on what you're doing, you know, but um, you're saying there that you want um, occasional hunting and some days at the range. So, I mean, if you were doing uh, like bench rest competition and shooting for matches, by all means, you're going to get a fairly high magnification scope there. Um, with an adjustable parallax so you can shoot very accurately the different distances. But honestly, mate, for me, I mean, I've got three of these scopes now, and that's the Loophole VX Rimfire with the MOA uh, bullet drop compensators on it. Like, honestly, they're just fantastic. And I mean, I even put it on uh, my um, Anschutz 1710, I'm shooting out of 300 yards with accuracy on a 150 mil uh, gong, you know? So, so, you know, it proves that that scope um, is definitely capable, um, you know, of accurate shooting, you know, with a decent rifle, obviously. So, um, look, 
one of them might set you back no more than $350. So that would be my choice, honestly. Um, if you then want to go up in magnification, um, by all means, you could then sell the scope if you wanted. Um, you know, you're not going to lose a lot of money. You know what I mean? Because you, you're buying a fairly cheap scope, but it's still good quality. Um, you can then go up to something higher if you need it. But honestly, mate, I, I say to a lot of people, um, since using them myself, um, those three to nine by 40 uh, loophole VX rim fires are fantastic. The parallax is fixed at 60 yards, so perfect for uh, rim fire shooting. Um, honestly, mate, I just can't see you going wrong with it. All right, guys, so that concludes uh, December Q&A. And as I said, apologies for the delay there. Um, we've had a uh, little bit of break here on the farm and uh, we're back into the full swing of things now. So um, as you might have seen there with the posts that I did on uh, Instagram and Facebook there on Christmas Day, I uh, got myself a uh, brand new little um, Chris Defiance AR in uh, 22 of all things, one of my favorite calibers. So uh, I'll be signing all that in and using it on the farm. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, we've also got some other new gear coming in as well. Uh, some more knife reviews. Um, there's a heap of stuff there. So guys, uh, keep an eye out for it. We're gonna make uh, 2019 a big year and uh, please be a part of it. Okay guys, hope you enjoyed this month's Q&A. So we'll see you on the next edition.